As soon as I saw ChatGPT3 back in November of 2022, I thought this is going to be a game changer for long form writing, especially creative writing. I can't wait to write the next great novel with it. Well, it's now a year and a half later and multiple new versions of ChatGPT and other amazing large multimodal models have come out and I have tried to write novels, screenplays, short stories, and even YouTube scripts with several of them. And guess what? They all suck. Why are GPT so god awful at doing creative writing Writing, especially longer form creative writing. And will they ever be good enough to actually use? Let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. I want to start off this, I guess, controversial episode by saying I really, really respect large language models, chat GPT, Claude, Gemini, Llama, et cetera, et cetera. I think they are amazing accomplishments. So I want to start off by saying that, and they actually do have a place. They can do relatively short form writing. They're fantastic at writing emails for me. They're really good at creative ideation and brainstorming, but they are absolutely terrible at longer form content, especially creative longer form content content. So if you want them to write a poem, yeah, they can do a pretty good job at that. If you want them to write a short story, they're going to suck at it. If you want a novel, a full-length screenplay, or a script for a YouTube video that's say 25 minutes or a half hour, they are really, really bad at it right now. And believe me, I've tried, I tried to create my own Dr. Know-It-All GPT on OpenAI's site because they do those personal GPTs. It is atrocious. I spent a lot of time, like probably about three or four hours trying to get it to work right. I fed it transcripts. I tried to guide it and how to work and all of that stuff and it's just awful. And even though the title of today's video will probably be why does chat GPT suck because it's good for views and things like that. I'm not singling out OpenAI and ChatGPT, all of the LLMs that I've tried and all of the LMMs, large multimodal models, which are outgrowths of LLMs, all of these are just bad. They're really, really bad at this longer form content. So maybe a bunch of you are warming up your fingers to type nasty, nasty comments in the comment section, but I would say before you do that, try to get one of these models to actually write you something that's substantial. Let's call it more than 10,000 words, something along those lines. So try to get it to write you a short story or a screenplay or something like that. Just give it an idea and watch what it does. Even if you use all of the tricks like think out loud, show your reasoning, you know, give me all of this stuff step by step and you sort of guide it and say, write scene one, write scene two, write chapter one, whatever. If you try to do all of that stuff, it still sucks. It'll start off pretty darn well. Like the first few sentences or even few pages will go pretty well, but soon it goes off the rails and there's a very, very specific reason why. So what is this reason? Well, the reason is that LLMs and the things that have grown out of them, transformer-based GPTs, are based on next token prediction. So what they do is they take a prompt, like write me a short story about a girl and a boy that fall in love on Jupiter or something like that, right? Whatever. doesn't matter if it's super detailed or if it's super lightweight, like that particular prompt. And what it does is it just starts with a word, like, you know, it was a dark and stormy night on Jupiter or something, right? It just, it figures out the first word, then it figures out the most probable next word and the most probable next word and the most probable next word after that. And many of these LLMs will actually expose what's called the temperature, and the temperature is sort of a randomization. So if you set the temperature to zero, whatever the most likely next word is, that will pop up next. So if it's 51% chance that that word is supposed to be next, it will always put that word next. If you turn the temperature up, you know, towards one or greater than one or something like that, it throws in more randomization. So if cat has a 60% likelihood of being next, but there's another one that has a 30% likelihood, like dog or something, it might substitute dog in there for more creative answers. So that's what the temperature does. It just adds a randomization to the next word prediction. I've recently discovered I have significant issues with many of the pollutants right in my home, and it causes me a ton of phlegm and breathing problems. That's why I'm so happy I found today's sponsor, Neoplants, maker of NeoPX, the first bioengineered living air purifier. If you care about the air you breathe when you're working or just relaxing at home, then NeoPX is the perfect solution. Rather than buying an expensive, bulky, and power-consuming electric air purifier, you can use nature itself, supercharged by science, to purify the air around you. NeoPX PX was invented by PhD scientists to be up to 30 times more efficient at fighting indoor air pollution compared to regular houseplants, making it the perfectly quiet, living and breathing air purifier that also looks beautiful. Neo PX is a gorgeous, fully grown Marble Queen Pothos plant. I mean, look at it, it's absolutely beautiful. That's great in low light. A self-watering planter that shows you when you need to water the plant, and the magic touch, Neo Plant's bioengineered plant microbiome that eats harmful air pollution like volatile organic chemicals that can harm your health. And it's super easy to use. Just add power drops to the soil once a month, set the plant where it can get some sun, and water when the green indicator disappears. It couldn't be easier. As you know, 
know I'm a data nerd, so I bought an air quality monitor to see how well NeoPX did, and it amazed me. As you can see, the volatile organic chemicals, or TVOC, went from 0.546 milligrams per cubic meter down to only 0.016 milligrams per cubic meter with my NeoPX. I'm breathing easier already. Be sure to click the link below or scan the QR code to get an extra power drop sachet when you order your NeoPX. That's seven months of pure air. A big thanks once again to NeoPlants for sponsoring today's video and you for watching. Be sure to use my link to get a seventh month of pure air when you order a NeoPX, and now let's get back to it. And so without going into details, that's basically how transformers work. They just figure out what to pay attention to and what's come before, and they use that attention to figure out what the next word is, and they just go about their merry way, you know, without getting into details about how it works. That's the basics of how these GPTs, or generative pre-trained transformers, work. They've trained on a gigantic corpus of data, like trillions and trillions of tokens, which is basically just parts of words. So again, a word like walking or something like that would be the word walk, and then ing, I, I mean, at least under some tokenization schemes. There are different ones and everything, but anyway, you can think about it that way. So, you know, as opposed to a word like walking, you have two parts of a word, so that's two tokens for one word. So that's the difference between tokens and words, but it really doesn't matter for this discussion. You can just think of it as words. But anyway, it's doing next word prediction, basically, next token prediction, next word prediction. And so that's gonna work really, really well for short form stuff, like writing a poem or writing an email, or give me 10 really good viral titles for my YouTube video that's about why ChatGPT sucks, you know, right? I think I'm probably going to use the one that I invented for this, but I do use it for that. I use it for ideation. Same thing, I use it for images and stuff like that. I will ask Dolly to generate me images to try to get my brain going to think about things in a different way. And that does have an amazing place, and it's made me much more productive, so I'm not denying any of that. But coincidentally, for my company, for Artomatic, I'm doing market research interviews right now for our National Science Foundation grant, and we're doing this kind of stuff. And I was talking to somebody in the visual effects industry yesterday, and he was talking about how AI has been way overhyped in Hollywood. He said that Hollywood studios and producers were basically gaslighting the people on strike last year about how good the potential for AI was so that people would, you know, would bend to their will and would negotiate a better deal for the studios and the producers and a worse deal for them. So that was a really interesting take. I, I'm not going to give an opinion on that because I don't have as much of an inside view of Hollywood as he does, but it's an interesting opinion about this, about how AI is being overhyped. And I think we've all seen seen that, right? It's being overhyped everywhere. It's like, if you have AI in your startup name, supposedly you can raise money like left and right. I still haven't figured that out. We actually do use AI on our product and we still haven't raised the kind of money we need. But anyway, it seems to be the table stakes at this point. Even if you have a company that makes pet food or something, it's like AI based pet food. So with that in mind, let's think about next token prediction. It really does have a place and it's really amazing for short form writing. Again, for an email, for a poem, for ideating really quickly or something along those lines. Where it starts to fall apart is where things get longer. It's like the longer it gets, the more that the next token prediction is just predicting the next word in the sense of just like looking through a dictionary and just finding the next word. Now, it does it really, really effectively, and you would never notice on a sentence-by-sentence -sentence basis. It all makes perfect sense in a sentence-by-sentence -sentence basis, but it doesn't make sense on a paragraph-by-paragraph -paragraph basis and a chapter-by-chapter -chapter basis and an entire novel basis. It really falls apart at that point. So the very foundation of GPT's next token prediction is actually at the heart of why they suck so bad at long form content. But even worse than that, they're really particularly bad in creative long form content. In other words, things like short stories or novels or screenplays or the like, they're, they're very, very poor at that just because they fall off the rails over time. It's just hard for them to keep track of that. There's no ability for these models to step back and reflect on things. Now, people are actually working on that. That is an active research research area, and that's something I'm going to talk about when I get to the how do we solve this section, so I'm going to table that for just a minute. But the basic problem is next token prediction is just really, really bad. The longer you get, the worse it's going to get. It's going to kind of regress to the mean. It's going to go backwards and backwards and backwards to just telling you really bland vanilla stuff that just follows the overall distribution of content, and that's not what we want from fiction in particular. From fiction, we want something unusual and sparking the imagination and something you wouldn't have thought of necessarily yourself. And it really, really falls apart at that. The second reason why I think that they're so bad at creativity in particular is skewed training data. So if
if you think about the amount of nonfiction writing that's out there, and today I'm just going to focus on writing. You know, you could talk about pictures and stuff like that too. But focusing on writing, there is way more nonfiction writing out there. If you just go out and willy-nilly scrape the internet for every Project Gutenberg, which is a collection of famous fiction, it's an amazing site, but it's just one site. For every one of those, there are thousands of blogs, there are thousands of emails, there are millions of Facebook posts and billions of X slash Twitter posts. There's tons and tons and tons of nonfiction data that's out there in even most uh, writing. You know, if you take books and things and ingest them, most books are nonfiction books. So there's a huge skew in the data towards nonfiction type writing, non-creative type writing. And while I don't have proof of this, I'm very strongly convinced that this is one of the reasons why GPTs do better at nonfiction, non-creative type writing than they do at creative type writing. It's just a skew in the data. The data is, you know, if it's 90% or 95% nonfiction, it's just going to do a better job at that because that's the distribution of data. So when you ask it to do something creative, it's just not very good at it because it hasn't seen enough of it. And then beyond that, our bar for creative writing, for screenplays, novels, etc., is much, much higher than for nonfiction. If the writing is adequate and you're learning about Fortran or whatever, I'm sorry, I just watched Hidden Figures and she read a book on Fortran, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter if the writing is good or not. It's just as long as it's adequate to get the job done, it's fine. But our bar for fiction is much, much higher. Think about the number of books or movies that you've read or seen that you're like, yeah, that is an amazing work. It's probably, you know, on the order of 10 of each of those. And so there are just not that many examples of really, really great creative writing. It's much, much reduced from the amount of nonfiction. So in addition to the poor performance of Next Token Prediction for long form content, you've also got added on top of that, creative writing is very poorly represented and really good creative writing is really, really poorly represented in the data set. And then the final problem is hallucination, but it's backwards of what you think. Everyone's like, oh, we can't have hallucination. We can't have these GPTs telling us that, you know, men didn't walk on the moon or whatever conspiracy theory you want, or just flat out wrong things like the earth is flat, stuff like that. You can't have GPTs doing this. So the training, the reinforcement learning, all of that stuff is designed to beat hallucinations out out of these large language models. The problem is when you're doing creative writing, you want to hallucinate. The best thing you can think of, right? If you're trying to write a science fiction novel about a planet that's orbiting Alpha Centauri, you got to hallucinate, right? There's no real life examples around here. It's like, well, how do you do that? You have to like dream, you have to think. And that's part of the creative writing process. And again, this is just my opinion, but in my opinion, the fact that we have beaten hallucination out of these GPTs, large language models, as much as possible, is a huge negative for creative writing. We need that hallucination. And without that hallucination, we've got serious problems with creative writing. So those are the main problems. The really, really big one is next token prediction is just bad at long form content, period. The next one is that the data set is highly skewed towards nonfiction writing. And the third one is that we've beaten hallucination out of these LLMs. So how do we fix this problem? This is, of course, speculative. Some of this stuff is being worked on right now, but of course, I'm speculating on how this could be fixed because it's a few future thing. We don't know. There may be a discovery that's really amazing that's actually way better than what I'm thinking about. But at least as far as I can see, this is how we can fix these to do a better job at long form content and specifically creative writing. To deal with the problems of next token prediction, what we need is agency and reflection. So agency is giving a GPT one or more personalities, right? You have an agent, you have a thing that's actually thinking independent of you. It's acting on your behalf. It's not just responding to you and predicting next tokens, but it's actually trying to please you in a way that kind of understands you as an entity, as a conscious entity, and itself as some sort of entity. I wouldn't say conscious, but it has an idea of itself as an agent in the world, and it goes out and helps you. So there's a subtle difference, but it's a very important difference. An agent has its own willpower, and that, in my mind, makes agents much more scary because that's exactly the kind of thing like HAL in 2001, where it can go, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Dave, right? It has its own willpower. ChatGPT isn't going to do that. I guess if you ask it, you know, how do I build a chemical weapon or something like that, it will tell you no. But that's not because of the base GPT. That's because of a layer that's been added on top for safety. The GPT will be happy to answer that question for you because the idea is it's supposed to please you. When you get to an agent, an agent has its own individual will and interest in things. Now, it's going to be designed to be helpful, but it's not designed to only respond to what you're saying. It's designed to go out and think about things on its own. And then speaking of that, you've got reflection, of course. So an agent can reflect. You can say, can you please go out and write this screenplay or novel?
novel or short story, but then, you know, write half of it and go and look at it again and kind of like read it over, think about it, decide whether it's good or not, whether it's fulfilling what I've asked it to do, whether it matches the style of other writers that I've requested, whatever those things are. The agent can go in and it can have its own agenda and it can reflect on things. So these two things are intimately intertwined. Agency and reflection need to happen. Now, a lot of people are trying to do reflection, I believe, without agency. They're saying things like in the prompts, please reflect on your work, please show your train of thought, things like that. And that's only going to work so well in a traditional LLM because it doesn't have agency. And because it doesn't have agency, the reflection is just kind of like a kludge that's put on top. But if you build an actual agent, again, think about it if you asked a creative writer friend of yours to go write you this story about a boy and girl falling in love on Jupiter or something, right? You know, that person, you would give them some instructions, but then they would go off and do their own thing and they would write some of it, they'd reflect on it. Maybe they'd come back to you and say like, here's my outline, what do you think about that? So that person would act agentically. They would have their own agenda. They would try to fulfill what you're saying, but they would inject their own thoughts on that and then they might come back to you and ask for your opinion on things. That's how you want an AI agent to work. An LLM just kind of just spews out the answer and that's it. And it really doesn't know exactly what it did before, especially after a certain amount of time. The window behind it starts to close. And I know even with a million token context window, it starts to close in the sense of not like it can't remember that stuff, but it becomes less and less important. It kind of tails off. And again, it just sort of regresses to the mean. Whatever the most likely next word is, that's what it's going to predict. That's not creative writing. It's not good long form writing in general, even for nonfiction writing and stuff. So you really want an agent that can reflect. That's the number one thing that has to get fixed in order to make these LLMs better. The next thing we want specifically for creative writing is a much better, more specific data set. A data set that features short stories, novels, screenplays, etc. Something along those lines that you can take a basic GPT and you can fine tune it to be very specific to creative writing. So that's easy to say. It's a little more difficult to do because like I said, the data set for creative writing and especially good creative writing is relatively small. So what you'll likely have to do is data augmentation to some extent. But if you take a pre-trained GPT and you fine tune it for creative writing. So creative GPT or something along those lines. This is something that any of these large companies could do easily. And actually with open weight models like Llama, individuals could do that. The problem is that those models just aren't as good as the closed source ones. So I would ask of Anthropic or OpenAI or Google or Meta or whoever, if you guys have the ability to please do a creative writing version of these GPTs. I think with some fine tuning and using the data that we have and augmenting that in some clever ways that you could create something way better for creative writing. And then if you combine that with agentic reflection, you could get something way better for longer form creative writing. And then last but not least, while we're talking about retraining these models, retrain the models to allow them to hallucinate. In fact, encourage it. That's the whole point of creative writing. You have to dream, you have to hallucinate, you have to think about things that don't exist in order to do that kind of writing. So retrain these models to privilege hallucination rather than trying to beat it out of them. So I've explained why GPTs suck in my opinion and also how to fix them. We need reflective agency, we need a better training set, and we need to encourage the these things to hallucinate. I think with a combination of these things, we can get much more interesting and creative large language models or large multimodal models as they're now being trained on video and other sources as well. All right, so obviously this is all my opinion. Definitely let me know in the comments what you think. If you disagree strongly, that's fine. Just do it in a nice constructive manner. Don't flame me or whatever. And I will be happy to try to respond to that. If you agree, if you've had bad experiences with GPTs trying to do longer form content and especially creative writing, also definitely let me know that in the comments because I would be quite interested. And while you're down there, if you don't mind liking and subscribing, it really, really helps out the channel. So thank you so much. And finally, a big thanks once again to Neoplants for sponsoring today's video. Be sure to use my link in the description to get a seventh month of pure air and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.